This is uh, April 21st uh, presentation um, by Chris Schmidt, um, the Upper Valley Wood Turners. Chris is, is an expert at many things and including bowl turning. He's going to show us a technique for decorating bowls. Without further ado. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm Chris Schmidt. I'm the design technology teacher here at Thetford Academy. This is our shop. I'm very fortunate to have these facilities, um, some of which have been generously donated by this group and the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. So, so thank you to all of you for your support. Um, I've been turning for about seven years now. I don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself a lifelong learner. I've made some good progress over the years, um, partially through this group. This group's been a fantastic way for me to learn, um, but also by taking some um, workshops with various different wood turners. So today we're gonna to be talking primarily about the effects of milk paint on cherry wood. So the milk paint, the milk paint is, that I use is just called old fashioned milk paint. It's available for about $14 per package. Comes in a lot of different colors. They're all kind of muted, kind of old fashioned colors, makes sense. Um, available at, uh, uh, I go to um, Craft Supply online, get it there. Um, Milk paint is a non-toxic, you know, totally food safe. Um, it has the milk proteins in it that, that harden it, and it's quite durable. It's used in a lot of kids' toys. Um, but the, the two people who turned me on to this, uh, Beth Ireland did some turning demonstrations for us here, and she was doing her bandsaw boxes, and also some um, various wood instruments that she did some turning on the neck and, and other aspects of it. And she used a lot. And then the other person was Alan Sturt, who came in and did a nice presentation for us, particularly on his squared around bowls. And he was using milk paint. He was the one who showed me the, um, the reaction you get when you put the pitch black paint on the cherry, you really get a copper look. So I was showing during our show and tell, this is just black on cherry and then buffed back almost all off so that you get that older appearance. Um, this is the latest version of iterations of different things that I've tried, um, and I found that these sell quite well at the craft fairs. Uh, because we have different levels of turning here, I wanted to do a little bit of work on the lathe. I didn't think you wanted to sit there and just watch me sand off milk paint all afternoon. Um, so the way I've set this up is to do a little bit of turning, demonstrate a few of the techniques we just did in our last two sessions of uh, introductory bowl turning. Um, but in, in this case, I'm doing twice turned wood. Um, this is a piece that I turned, I don't know, maybe three months ago out of cherry. It was actually the coring of a larger one. Um, it's gone oval as it dried. I don't know if it's down to 10% yet or not, but it's, it's dry enough for me. Um, and I'll be turning that one. I'm giving the same presentation next week, so I'll be turning that one next week. Uh, it's down to about three quarters of an inch, half to three quarters of an inch. Um, so I'll pass that around if people just want to see. I didn't worry too much about how perfect the finish was. I just wanted a very even wall thickness so that as it dried, it would dry fairly evenly. I, I did speed that up in the microwave a little bit, and then I just left it out. And in the winter months here, when our heat is on, which was up until about two days ago, um, things dry out quite a bit just in the shop here. Um, I mentioned Al Sturt. Uh, this is the actual demonstration piece that he did for us in the demonstration. Um, and I wanted to pass that around because I in no way profess to be um, at his skill level. And there are a lot of things he does here, not just technique wise on the lathe, but as an artist. Um, I think that every time we do a little bit of turning, we focus primarily on the skills of turning. Uh, we do talk a little bit about bowl shape, or Mike gets into some of the artistry of his work, um, but there's more to being an artist than just perfect technique, um, a lot of creativity. And in some cases, I think the thing I was most inspired by and surprised by was the lack of precision, the sort of freedom that he takes in carving the rim. And I'll show you that today. Um, but he turned this, unfortunately, I don't know why we provided him a maple we didn't have cherry at the time, which was a little silly, so it defeats the purpose of getting the reaction. But we gave him a, a chunk of dry square maple. He turned it. The couple of things he emphasized was he likes to put three slight coves on the back. Can we see that in the camera okay? So three slight coves. And then he uses a shear scraper to put a little texture into it. So it's just a little bit of texture. I get that. 
a little sideways. Can we see it okay? Maybe a little that way. Well, it has some micro beads on there that will uh, take the, the buffing differently. You know, the high points will buff off more than the low points. Um, he does like to put a boundary on his carving. So whether you're doing the rim of a bowl or uh, um, squared around, some kind of a boundary, and he carves inside of that boundary. And then he showed us a couple of different techniques. Um, the crosshatch pattern uh, with one carving tool. And the tools that he's using are uh, little carbide high-speed tools that go on a rotary. I just have them on a Dremel here. And he had different, different tips. Um, one was just pointed. That's the one that he used here. The other one is rounded. It's what he used here. Another one has three points offset so that every time you make a stroke, you get three little lines. And he does some waviness and he does some sort of organic grassy patterns. Um, and so I'd like to just pass that around so people can see what a real pro did. I did a three-day workshop with him. We started off just turning bowls and working on some basic technique that I'm going to show you next. And then we actually did a couple. Um, I've sold two or three of these. They're some of my higher priced items. Um, but these are a couple later, later ones that I've done that I'd like to pass around. I think with the green milk paint, you really get that coppery look. Um, everybody who comes up to the table when I'm selling at the craft fair, they'll say, wait, that's wood. And they'll want to hook it up and they think it's either ceramic or copper. So we can pass that one around. And of course, anyone who knows me, you know that I like to work with the computer design and the CAD and CAM machines. So um, this was to see if I could use the CNC carving machine to carve a, a Celtic knot pattern. Um, I'm sure Mike would probably do it with pyrography. Someone else would do it with hand tools. Um, I don't have that patience. Uh, so this was done using the CNC machine. I needed a fairly flat surface to do it, however. You'll notice this has a nice curve to it, um, whereas this surface is pretty flat. Um, but I'll pass that around. And those both have a final finish of a, a spray on um, lacquer. Uh, this is what I ended up with as, as my next iteration of the process. That was to take his squared around technique and say, with, with a lot of texture, and say, well, what if I tried that on a bowl with a flat surface? Um, yeah, I'll have a little bit of carving in the rim, but what happens to it if you, if you sand through milk paint on a bowl? And I think it happened as a bit of an accident. Um, I wanted something blue because uh, one of my friends here does a lot of ceramics. And he claims that if he, if, he, if he puts a blue glaze on it, it sells. So I said, all right, I'll make some blue bowls. And I think probably one of the first ones was because it had a crack in it and I wanted to hide the crack. This one, I think, has a crack somewhere. You can probably find it. It's been repaired with, with, a pot, with uh, I think probably just with CA glue, um, sanded over real well. And then I wanted to hide it with the paint. Of course, it's always going to be a little bit of a different texture there, you know, where you're, where you're putting it onto the CA glue. So it does show up. Um, but I think I painted one blue. And then if you ever worked with milk paint, it gives you this really grainy, rough surface. You, you hate it when you first look at it. And so you're supposed to sand it and then do another coat and then finally sand it and do a very thin coat at the end that hopefully will dry fairly flat. Um, and then put some kind of a sealer over it. So I thought, all right, well, I'll, I'll put it on and I'll sand it back. I'll put another coat on it. And as I sanded it back, I started to get that sanding through in a few different spots. I thought, hey, that looks kind of cool. And I said, what would happen if I just put a finish on that? Um, and I had a test piece. I think I tried four or five different final coats. Um, I used the wipe on poly. I used the spray on lacquer. And I used some of the just general finishes, wipe on um, it's like a poly, basically, but it's a, a different solvent, so it's food safe. Uh, and I put that on, and that actually brought out the color of the blue the best. Um, and so that's what this has. This probably has uh, one or two coats of the wipe on um, salad bowl finish, general finishes salad bowl finish. And so I did a couple of those. They sold quite well. We can pass that around. And then for the last craft fair this fall, I was getting some ready to do blue. And I thought, you know, the, the coppery look itself looks kind of cool. And so I just threw a finish on that. And, and here's one that I have a finish on. This has a wipe on poly finish that I did on the lathe. Um, but it really has that antique look to it. And those were the first two bowls. I did two of those. They were the first two to sell at the craft fair. I thought, hmm, maybe I'm onto something. Maybe they don't have to be blue. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the technique to do all of these. 
Um, but we can go ahead and pass that one around as well. And that is hollowed out end grain. Um, I had prepared two, two bowls, one larger for this group, which of course, when I tried to speed it up in the uh, microwave, it cracked. So I found a bowl that a student had done a while ago that he had turned twice. It was round, but it was pretty rough. I don't know whether we can see on here the tear out. This was turned, but not, not sanded. And there was quite a bit of tear out. You can see quite a bit of tear out in there and there. Um, but it was still pretty thick, it was, and, I, and I checked it out. I've done the, the top rim just to make sure it would be thick enough for me to turn it again. But I just want to do a couple last passes on this to show you how to avoid sanding with the 80 grit bowl gouge that some of us start with. Um, it is dry wood, so it will sand quite a bit quicker than wet wood. You know, wet wood, you got to let it dry overnight at least before you start sanding it, or all you do is gum up your sandpaper. So I've got a very sharp tool. I am, and, and I've put this in a jam chuck. Sometimes if they're really thick, I'll actually drive my drive center into it, knowing that I'll turn that out. But I'm not gonna turn much off the inside of this. So I've got it on a jam chuck. I got it as centered as I could. And, uh, and I've already done the rim, so I'm not gonna touch that. I'm just gonna do a little bit in the shape. And this is a little bit of a dog dish, meaning it comes out and then as a corner and comes up. And it's thick enough in there that I can get rid of that. I want that to be a little more of a subtle curve. If you don't own one of these lights, it's the best investment you can make in terms, you can just set those up on the table there. Best investment you can make. This improved my turning overnight um, by 50% probably. Uh, it allows you to see what you're doing. It allows you to see tear out. You can put it at different angles. You can see what your curve looks like. So if you don't own one, I highly recommend it. They're about, I don't know, 60, 70 bucks. Again, you can get them at Craft Supply or various other places online. I've come in riding the bevel. I've created a foot. That's gonna be my final foot and come out to here. I've established the top of my bowl there. And now in between the two, I wanna get a nice curve. I'm gonna start off riding the bevel. So I'm way over here with my handle when I start. I'm gonna go to an underhand grip so I don't need to take off much. I've got it in this triangle, in this triangle, pretty set. So I'm controlling it with my hips. I've got a lot more control in my hips than I do in my hands. And I'm gonna to try to take this curve and soften it just a little bit here. I'm gonna get, it's getting pretty thin, so I'm gonna get a little bit of chatter. I'm feeding relatively slowly. I'm moving from right to left, only as quickly as the speed of the lathe will allow. Make sure I've still got enough wood in there, yeah. Take a little more off right here. Until I've got the shape that I'm looking for, that's a much better shape than it was before. And I've got that little bit of chatter, so I'm gonna get those slight spirals there. One way to avoid that is to actually use your fingertips. It's a little hard to do on the outside of a bowl, but just to support it. And that does get pretty hot. That gets rid of some of it. Right. So I've got a much better shape. You can see there's still some high spots in there. And I've got, you know, quite a bit less tear out. Uh, can we get that little bit of tear out right there? Can you see that? I don't know. Yeah, but if we, if we don't have a, if I do it like that, is that any better? Too bright. Um, well, there's a little bit of tear out. It's always on the uphill side. So here's your end grain, here's your tear out. And so the next thing to do is to do some shear scraping. Uh, I always make that last pass with a freshly sharpened tool. I'm using 
I'm doing a push cut, so I'm cutting on 11 o'clock about. Now I'm gonna do my shear scraping, and be more at like nine or 10 o'clock on the tool, over on the wing. Very important, get this out of the way, that you drop down at an angle and you're shear scraping, get this out of the way as well. And I come in and I barely touch it. And I wanna be getting these tiny, tiny curly Q shavings that'll float in the air, All right? If you come in flat, you'll get sawdust. All right, and you'll get a little bit of tear out when you do that. It's much better if you are at an angle. I go about 45 degrees, closing the flute all the way so you're, you're just barely touching on the bottom edge. The top edge is close, but not quite touching. You're just riding on that bottom edge and barely touching it. The, the lighter the touch, the smaller those little shavings will be that float in the air. Now, some people like to go both directions, use their. But I have trouble doing that. So what I do, I move my tool rest over, and I often will speed it up to, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 to do this. There's 1,000 there. And I'll come all the way over. Now it is tough. It is tough to tuck into the corner right there. So I'll come in in the corner and I'll just barely get it. Go in the other direction. I don't know if it'll work on the camera, but I'll look for any high spots or I'll look for any drastic changes in my curve using my light. And you can go both directions. And if you do that, you should be able to start sanding with 220 maybe. When David Ellsworth was here demonstrating, he said he didn't even sand. He just leaves it as a sort of almost a sandstone look to it. Uh, but if we go back to where the tear out was, right here, uh, let's see, end grain, here's where our tear out was, there's basically none. There are a few little ridges, but those will sand out in no time. Now, I'm not going to worry about it too much because I'm going to use, yeah, turn, turn it off, yeah. I'm going to use this shear scraper. It's fairly blunt. It has a slight curve to it, and I've put just, so it's fairly fairly straight across the end. It's got a little bit of an angle, a little bit of a curve, and it's sharpened, I don't know, at 80 degrees, probably 75, 80 degrees. And I did put a slight hone on it, um, which I don't normally bother to do, but for you guys, I just took one of these and just put a little hone on it, which is supposed to give it just that little bit of a burr on there. And rather than doing that shear scraping with the bowl gouge, Alan does it by dropping his tool down below the bowl so he's scraping like he's using a card scraper and coming in and doing this. And again, he gets those little tiny floating shavings. But the cool thing that I liked was that's how he got those little micro beads. He just took this, he just pushed in. He's not trying to get them in any kind of, you know, perfect distance between. He's just, he can go back and fill in a few spots. I think the overall density should be about the same, but the distance between any two of them can be whatever you want it to be. And you're not going deep, just enough so that when you sand, you've got some high spots. Can, can we see that on the camera? I don't know. So I've just added a little bit of texture in there. All right. Um, <laughs> is 
So I'm not sure what you mean by a negative rake scraper. Oh, uh, it doesn't have to. It does only because I've done it a couple of times. But I'm on the outside of the bowl, so I'm only touching it on that leading edge. If I were on the inside of the bowl, then you would want to have um, a couple different bevels on it. Um, I don't use this on the inside. Uh, except that I'm at, a, I'm at an angle and I'm using the uh, burr on it to scrape, like a card scraper. I'm using it like a card scraper for those of you who are woodworkers rather than bowl turners. Um, the very last thing I do is I make sure that my uh, round tenon there is perfectly squared up the size I want because things may have moved or shifted. So I've got that perfect and I'm ready to turn it around. I keep my little knob on there. Everybody knows that. I'm trying to just do a little bit of review for people who are at different levels here. My jam chuck off. I didn't bother to put any padding on that because I'm going to turn it again here. And I should be a pretty good size. Uh, I probably would do a little bit of light sanding on the outside before I flip it around, you know, 220 and 320. I'm not going to, you guys don't need to see that. But what I would like to do is just finish off the inside here. Um, again, someone was asking you about the extension to the bed. This is the Powermatic version. Um, it isn't cheap. Anybody know what that runs for? 365, 400. Um, it's not cheap, but boy, it is nice to be able to get all the way out of the way. Or when the students are doing baseball bats, I give them enough extra at either end. I don't have to be exactly 36 inches or 32 inches or whatever the baseball bat is. It gives a little bit extra so they can have some of that scrap. Um, but I do like that quite a bit. They also have the swing away one, yeah. All right. So switching gear a little bit here. Does that make it so we can't see on camera? Again, I think for the inside, you really need that harsh light. It, and, and I don't know whether you can see it, but I can really see a lot of tear out in here. So if the student, he didn't bother sanding this, probably because he didn't want to have to sand that off. That would take a while to sand out. We'd have to use an 80 grit power sander, making a lot of sawdust, um, which is what I used to do. My first few bowls, I would sand for about four hours a piece. Um, you know, turn for two hours and sand for four hours and then sell it for 40 bucks. <laughs> That's not a very good profit margin. So we're trying to cut down on the amount of sanding that you do. And there's just a certain satisfaction to having those last few passes really clean it up. Uh, I will just, since we've got people sitting in the front row there, I will just double check that we're nice and tight. One, I do two. Uh, David McWilliams says you should always go and check that other one, three. But for some reason, you can always tighten it a little bit more. Being dry wood, that's cutting in there quite nicely. That's not going to go anywhere. I am, however, about as thin as I can get out at this leading edge. I'm going to get a lot. I'm going to get a lot of chatter there. Because it's already thin. All right, so now we're gonna, that was just to get it, get it completely round and get rid of some of the wood. I got a good thickness there. I'll go a little bit more. I'll go a little more. So now it's perfectly round. I've gotten rid of the worst of the, of the uh, tear out, but I'm gonna switch to that uh, riding the bevel on the left side of the tool. So instead of, instead of riding the bevel with a push cut, cutting at one o'clock or so, I'm gonna turn the flute straight up. I'm gonna rub the left side of the bevel and it's best to have a, at least an Irish grind, that double bevel. On this one, I actually have three bevels, or I had three. Um, so that top bevel is very thin. We come out and we're gonna just barely turn into it. We're gonna start where we're not cutting. This is, I think someone mentioned they got a pretty good um, catch doing this. Key is 
to roll into it slowly until you find where you just barely cut. And I'll ride that down. Now, to get rid of that chatter, I can put my left hand on it, support it a little bit. I'm going to just barely roll into it. And again, I'm getting these little tiny slices that are floating in the air. I'm going to switch to this guy because he's probably a little sharper. My goal is to not have to sharpen my tools next week. So I'm seeing if I can do a little bit with each tool. There we go. And I'm looking for whiter circles. If I see a white spot, I know there's a little tear out there. Right there. Still got a little too much chatter. There we go. The chatter will give you those little chatter high spots. They do sand out pretty easily. It's the tear out that takes forever to sand out. So I'm gonna call that good enough for out there. And then for the bottom, I like to use, we were talking about that bottom feeder. So this is sanded at about, I don't know, 85 degrees. And then it's got a couple more bevels to get rid of the heel. But I'm going in almost straight on. And I like to have a lot of support for the tool because if you go up, that's when you get a catch. I wanna be just wherever it's gonna be taken off those smallest. And again, I'll rub the bevel. And I don't, I don't use it out here much. I probably could. I use it more right about here. If I can spot, there we go. See if I can get a few of these to float in the air. And you can go both directions with it. There we go. It does, they do fold over the end. So you have to brush it off every now and then. There we go. puts this hand down when he grinds it. Uh, he didn't when I was with him because he just did it right on a set grindstone with a platform. To get a little bit off of there so you, have, you can lead it. Sure. And my goal is, I've still got a few circular spots, but my goal is to get rid of much of the tear out as possible. And it's not as, as great as I'd like it to be, but I don't want to spend all day doing it. But then the other thing that in, uh, drastically improved my speed of production was to switch to power sand. All right, so I'm not going to do a lot, but while it's turning, a little bit slower, 500 or so, come in and you want your sander turning the opposite direction. And I like these because you can switch grits without taking them off your uh, Velcro. They twist off and you can put a new grit on. So if I wanted something a little heavier, I think that one was 220. I got to at least start with 150. I come in like this. The only problem is if you try to go in reverse, you're going to unscrew it. It's going to come off. You can do it gently, but it pops off. 
So I actually like these guys a little bit better for, for that reason. Yeah, so I can't tell you how many times that pops off on me because I'm trying to do it in both directions. So this is just a little foam pad. Again, I pick them up at Craft Supply. I think I just got a kit where I got a th uh, two inch plus five discs for, I don't know, $20 or something. So they're not expensive. And for a small bowl like this, Chuck at my drill. So let's see. I'm going that way. I want to be going this way with my drill. And when I'm in, I'm in reverse on the lathe right now. And so I'll do it on the near or top side. Of course, that came off, huh? That was brand new. And then if I want to go the other way, I'm only going to do a tiny bit more here. come off already well we'll just hand sand that because I think we're pretty much so in terms of hand sanding I like to use the gold sandpaper from um, Klingspor it's a cloth backed it stands up quite well um, and we'll just take and I like to it rips easily so I do try to get rid of any of the little strands. And I like to fold it over, fold it over a little piece of cardboard. And when you're in forward, you stand on the bottom. And when you're in reverse, you stand up top. So I'd go through all the different sandpapers. I've still got a tiny bit of tear out that I'd come in and get with a hand sander, but go through all the sandpapers and get that done down to 320. And then I would do the layout and carving on the rim. And the layout, you're not actually following the lines. You're just using them as a guide. So it doesn't really matter where you put them. But if I slow that down a bit. And you can go, I'll go forward. And I just use my tool rest and I'm just putting a series of pencil lines on there to tell me concentric circles. And if they didn't, if you're, I'm already a little out of rounds. That bowl must have been not completely dry even though it's been sitting in the shop probably for eight or 10 years. Uh, even dry wood will have some various tensions in it. You know, so if you take a dry board and you split it down the middle, it often goes like that because the two sides have tension in them. And then I need some lines that are, that are headed straight out from the center. So I get my tool rest at exactly the center height, which it should be sitting right there. And I don't do anything fancy. You can, you can get a stand with a pencil in it and run it across, but I just use my tool rest. I just make sure I'm not turning it. And you don't need a lot. This is just to keep you, as you're carving, keep you trying to stay in, in a starburst, so to speak, coming out from, now can we see those on the camera? All right, and then I, when I do a rim, I do carve it right on the lathe. I'm using uh, just a regular Dremel tool. It's a multi-speed. It's got that carbide tip in it, which you can get through Al Sturt. Someone else makes them, I'm not sure who it is. Does anybody know who actually makes and distributes those? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a carbide chisel. Um, so you gotta be a little careful because you're, you're carving now and you're unprotected, so don't take your fingers off with it. But I just come in, I keep it pretty fast. And I'm only gonna do a little section here. And it's nothing fancy. Random pattern. Go back and fill in wherever you, Now, the one thing you want to watch out for, which I just did right there, is you want those boundaries to your carving. You don't want to come up over the top rim if you can help it. I did catch one there. I'd like to say I did it on purpose, but I didn't. Uh, it happened on this one really badly in a couple of spots, and so then I just brought it up over the edge. 
but you really would like to keep your carving bounded by that rim, right? So I would do that for a while, then I'd come around and I'd, I'd go the other way, following these circles. And I'm traveling from right to left against the cutter head. You know, it's pretty much a universal law in wood turning that you wanna feed your wood opposite to the direction of the cutter head. So you're feeding into it, not with it. If you go the other way, it tends to take off on you. And then you might come back and say, oh, I needed a couple more here. And you'd go until you're happy with it. And I don't put a whole lot. I don't think it takes a whole lot. If you look at the one that um, Alan Sturt had done, his are quite dense. Um, you can go denser or less dense. Can we get, a, can we get that on camera? Okay. Um, and yeah, I've got a fair amount of tear out that I have to sand out there. I got a little more tear out that I got to get, I know, but let's pass that around and people can take a look at it. Yeah. Creative technologies. Creative technologies or woodworker supply has them. They're not cheap. I think I paid 70 bucks a piece. Does that sound right? What? Well, maybe it was 70 for the two of them. I got two. But I remember they weren't cheap. But you only need one or two of them. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's shift gears a little bit. Don't need that anymore. Uh, one other thing I recommend when you're when you're turning dry wood, it gets pretty hot. You know those chips flying off. Sixty one. Okay. So Alan was making a. $14 profit on it when he sold it to me, which is certainly fair. Um, but I'll often wear a glove on my left hand when I'm, when I'm turning uh, dry wood because the chips coming off get pretty hot. So uh, you can, different ones, you want something that conforms to your hand quite a bit. Realize if it's a little bit sticky, it's gonna stick to the wood more. So, you know, we all like to slow the bowl down with our hand. Just make sure that isn't gonna grab and send your hand down in between the, the bowl and the um, tool rest. But anyway, that's why this was out, was just to show you that. Uh, so I'm gonna try to use this as my work table. Someone stole my stool though. Do we have an extra stool somewhere I could? I can't, I don't think I can do it standing up. <clears throat> um, but I've got a piece here that's almost done with the carving. And with the squared around bowls, I do like to carve them off the lathe. I find it a little difficult to get in there. Uh, Alan started this awesome um, vacuum chuck carver's vise. You know, you just turn it on and it holds it and turn it off, turn it, turn it back on again. So there's a great idea is to, to use your vacuum chuck in the, as, as a carving vise. Um, but I don't think you necessarily need a carving vise. So I've done most of this. I'm just going to finish up a little bit here. Again, I set it up with the radial lines and the concentric circles. Not that I'm trying to follow the exact line, but they tell me what direction to go. And, and it really does help with the squared around, helps you head right towards the center. And this is where that freedom comes in of, you know, he wasn't doing anything. There was no plan. There was no mathematical, you know, Fibonacci spiral or anything. He's just organically throwing in some, no offense, Mike. I actually, you know, you know how much I admire your work. But I don't have the patience or probably the mathematical skills to do it. And I'm trying to get a similar density to what I had before. And I am getting a little bit of those edges, just so that they have some texture to them. And then I'll come around and I'll do my circles. Yeah, you won't get the same organic feel to it unless your drawing is very organic. You could easily, I mean, the fact is you can take a photo of something, live trace it on the computer, and then that's what it'll carve. So if you're really trying to emulate somebody, 
and you try not to have too many that dig in like that. What I like is I can rotate it so that I'm always going left to right, but I'm getting sort of a circle out of it as I go around. And you're looking for anywhere that it isn't quite as dense. Just call that good enough. Okay, so you get the idea. And you can do various different patterns. This is the same tool, but uh, a very organic pattern, just sort of a, a wavy, I almost feel it's like a forest, all right? Um, I'm gonna save this one to, to do at my next presentation, but if you wanna pass that one around just to see a different pattern. Now, once I've done that, I am gonna sand that just a little bit. And now here's where Peter will be happy. We're gonna switch to the, we're gonna switch to the uh, vacuum chuck. I will say, you don't have to use a vacuum chuck for these. You can always leave a foot on and finish it off when you're done which is what I'm gonna do. I don't know what they're gonna have down at Peter Block shop next week, but uh, I'm gonna leave my, my feet on. Finish, everything will be done, and then I'll finish that. And so the bottom of the, of the bowl will actually be natural cherry. And I found that a lot of the people at the um, craft fair really liked that they could pick it up and they could see the raw wood there, no matter what I had for a finish on it. Um, Do I have? Ah, what I found was yeah. it still sucks on there okay. okay. Um, I, I tested that out before today because I hadn't, I hadn't done it that way before with these, but um, turn that on, get it lined up in there. I don't worry too much. Yeah, and so that's gonna go right, it's got, four or five layers of foam on there, and it's gonna to conform to those circles, no problem. And I'm just gonna sand that a tiny bit, a little bit of 220, maybe some 320. I'm just getting rid of any of the fuzz. And I, you know, I'll, I'll do it with a lathe. I'm gonna put this on just in case now that I'm using the vacuum chuck, right? Um, you know, you can't really sand out on the wings all that well. I mean, I can get some of it out there. If I curve it up, that's probably enough. And if I go both directions, I'm trying to get rid of my pencil lines and get rid of any of the fluff. But the other thing you can do, you can come in with your power sander or your random orbital sander, or just by hand a little bit. I just want to round over those corners, get rid of any sharp edges. And if I can see my grain pattern, I'll try to go with the grain when I'm hand sanding. That's probably plenty. Um, you were asking about, would it stick with the carving? I don't have a, uh, I don't have a nub on the bottom of this one to line it up. So I just kind of use my finger and get it close. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. We'll call that good enough. And I'm pulling 15. So it's not quite the 25, but that's gonna hold it on for sanding, no problem. All right, so I'll have no problem sanding that later on. Okay, so we've got it finished, we've got it carved. We're not too worried about the sanding. We get it nice. On the bowls, I will, I will sand these down um, before I paint them, I'll sand them down to 320. And I'll try to not have any tear out, you know. On these, I don't worry if there's a little bit of tear out. In fact, if you look at some of these, there is some tear out in there, but it just adds some more texture and interest to it. All right. So the milk paint comes in a powder. You mix it, they recommend you mix it 50-50 with water. Here's some I just put in a jar, the green. You can see the powder. It is a little granular. They recommend mixing it with warm water, that that helps it melt a bit. Um, so I did warm up a little bit of water, but I've mixed this 
much thinner than they recommend. Um, I don't know exactly what the ratio is, but such that it's more of a stain than a paint. And then you let it sit for 15 minutes or so. I've let it sit since we did our, um, and you stir it up again so that it's as, as dissolved as you can. And uh, Al just uses, he just uses, you know those little throwaway paintbrushes you use sometimes to put glue on, the 99 cent ones? Um, or actually, no, I think they're more like 10 cents if you buy them by bulk. Uh, I, I at least get fancy and use a uh, small foam brush, but it really doesn't matter. You just need to get it on there somehow, all right? And you can see this is quite thin. Make sure you get it down in all the nooks and crannies. And you're trying to get a complete cover. If you don't, you can put a second coat on. I probably will give this a second coat when it's partially dry. And I try to get a fairly even coat, but it, again, you're sanding it off, so it doesn't matter if it's not perfect. You'll see there's some granularness to it. Um, How long do you think it's dry? Uh, it'll be dry enough in 10 minutes to put a second coat on. Um, I would let it dry for a couple hours before I actually sanded it down. So we're gonna sit here and uh, watch paint dry for a while. No, I've got one. I've got one painted that I'll I'll sand down a little bit. Um, my goal was to try to keep things moving along today. To have a lot of pieces at different stages. It is important you get it down in all those nooks and crannies, particularly when you do the blue paint. If you're gonna do blue, I don't know whether this one will end up blue or just the old black look. price tag from the and I do you know try to get some of my brush strokes going in a circular pattern there and there that's really all there is to it to getting the black on and if you've got a beautiful cherry bowl and you do that there's sort of this sense of oh my god what did I just do right and I don't you know it sticks to the paper but I don't care I'll I'll turn that off later so that I'll set aside to dry for, I got one. I do try not to have any big drips. We'll set that one aside. All right. So here's one that I painted yesterday. So it's had a chance to dry overnight. Uh, all I did on this one was put a little bit of carving in the rim. Otherwise, it's just a nice small bowl. Uh, my head of school came in one day and saw a bunch of these. He says, oh, you're teaching the kids to turn ashtrays. I was like, well, I guess so. But, um, you know, a little candy bowl or whatever it might be. And again, I probably would use a smaller chuck for this, but just for the interest of... Moving right along, we'll use the same one. And that's pulling 20 right there, so I, that's not a problem. And Alan just does it with the scotch Bright pads. They have green and blue. I forget which is heavier duty, I think the blue is, but this says heavy doer on it. They're just scrubbing pads that you buy at the you know, grocery store or at the hardware store for cleaning your pots and pans. And they've got just enough scrub on them to scrub off the paint. Now, again, I don't like to stand there and go for a long time. So I actually start with a little bit of 400 sandpaper, usually. And just sand a little bit off with the sandpaper. Now, if I'm going blue over the top of this, I do not want to sand through very much. I'm really just getting it smooth. I'm getting rid of some of the granularness, that's all. Go both directions. But because it was a pretty thin paint to begin with, you're gonna have a pretty good surface without doing a whole lot of sanding. And then I'll switch to my scotch bright pad, just buff that a little bit. Someone the other day was saying with sandpapers, you know, like, 
up through about 220, you're kind of cutting. And then after that, you're more polishing. Ed, was that you who was making that distinction the other day? Yeah. Yeah. And certainly brand new sandpaper cuts a little better. You know, once it's worn out, you're really just polishing or burnishing. And so again, I've, so now I've taken off very little, just smoothed it out, turn it over, get it relatively centered. And even with that carved rim, I'm all oh, that's going all the way up to 20 right there. So again, that's not going to come on. Um, I think it's just it's got enough padding around there that it's filling in. And once you get a seal, it just sucks itself tighter and tighter. Let's just see if I don't even bother with the sandpaper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, work with a small piece. You can probably work with half this. Fold it over. It does wear out pretty quickly. I'll use them until they pretty much fall apart. But they lose, just like sandpaper, they lose their buffing ability pretty quickly. But again, if you're, if you're um, doing your final buffing, you want it to get more and more polished, used 220 becomes 320, use it some more, it becomes 420, right? Not exactly, but it does, it does polish more and more. All right. So that's what I would do to the black. Now, if I was gonna finish it all the way to this, I would obviously do quite a bit more. But it's very important you don't sand through. I'm just starting to sand through the wood so that I see the raw cherry instead of the um, sort of stained look, the copper look. So you gotta be very careful not to sand through too much. That's where a little 320, or a little, uh, a little 400, maybe some 600 sandpaper, but switch to the scop right pad sooner than you would think because a scotch bright pad will, will buff, but it doesn't really take off the wood. Um, and so you can get that nice, shiny, more even finish. Um, and then this would be ready for the um, salad bowl finish as a final finish. We'll see that at the end. Um, and just at this point, it's probably good to show this. So this one, I did just, just what we saw here, but went a little further. And you can go as far as you want until you have a little bit of black left. Obviously, you're gonna have the black left in the carving. Um, it typically comes off corners and then stays on in between the corners. And uh, I did have one little spot of super glue there, so I recommend you try to avoid any super glue repairs because it won't stick very well to it. Can you see that in there? Yeah, yeah, you can see that. Um, and then on the lathe, I put uh, two coats of um, wipe on poly on that. And it gives you a pretty nice antique looking finish. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to vacuum chuck that. It's got some cracks down here. So I'll probably do a long, narrow jam chuck to finish that off. And I'll leave the bottom natural wood. Um, all right, blue. The blue has to be mixed to about 50-50 to their recommendation because you need it to stick and not drip too much. You need to have a thin enough coat that it doesn't drip, thick enough that it covers in one coat. What I found when I did two coats was that even if it's from the same batch, the second coat's a slightly different color. And you'll see that when you sand through it. You'll see two different colors. Now, there was an article, and I don't remember the guy's name, but in American Associated Woodturners magazine uh, must have been a year ago or so. There's a guy who, who does big vessels and then he, he textures them with carving. And he'll actually paint four or five different colors on there. And then he'll do the same sanding technique that I do. And he'll sand through different layers of the colors. And so you'll see blue and then red and then green and then whatever afterwards. Um, I haven't gone with, two, with, with more than just black and then the final color yet. Maybe I'll try it some, sometime. But. This one's ready for the blue. And I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a little better paintbrush this time. I think I can afford to. So I've got it stirred up, I let it sit. 
15 minutes or so, I stirred it up again, and it's, you know, probably, you know, a little bit, about the same thickness as a house paint, all right? And I'm just gonna put that on there. You can see it covers pretty well, but it has bubbles and grit in it. And you don't want drips if you can help it, although you can always sand those. You get a different effect, you'll probably sand through them and end up with a coppery spot there. And I, uh, I don't know what other people do when they do their finish, but I like to do the outside of the bowl first. I'll do this when I do the final finish as well. Do the outside of the bowl first, then I flip it up because the foot, I can always sand that down and finish it off by hand at the very end. So I don't care if it gets a little bit messed up. With this um, craft paper, a lot of the finishes, I can just tip it over, it'll dry just fine, it won't even stick. With the paint, it will stick to the craft paper. I just peel it off, and then I just make sure I sand that enough. Now, I would probably, if I weren't doing a presentation, I would probably now let it sit for five or 10 minutes in order to see where any drips were, come back in and just touch those up. I don't want you guys to have to wait around while I do that. So I will carefully flip it over and do the other side. Now here's where I often get drips. If you, if you pull across an edge, you know, you're gonna have a big drip there. So I'm, I'm a little bit more careful going around the rim, but I am trying to get it into all the nooks and crannies because they will stay blue when you sand. So this will be the, everywhere else you can sand off if it doesn't look good. But in those nooks and crannies, blue is your final color. So you wanna make sure that you get down in there. And if you're doing a bigger bowl, it does take a little more time, but it's the same process. I figured a little one like this, I could get done in just a few minutes and you guys wouldn't get too bored. I probably should have some interesting story to tell at this point. Uh, I have a new puppy. It's a rescue dog from uh, Mississippi named Huckleberry. He's, we, we had a black lab for 15 years who passed away last year. And so we love the lab mentality, that sort of sweet, sweet dog, particularly the sweet old dog. My wife wanted a puppy because she hadn't had a chance to raise a puppy from, from, you know, really young age before. So we looked at a bunch of dogs, including some black labs that were a little bit older, but they were a little bit shy. You know, the rescue dogs tend to be shy if they've been mistreated when they're young. And this puppy, he was only uh, three months old when they brought him up here. And we went to his house and there was a, glass door and he comes running to the glass door with this big smile on his face, just so eager to see us. We go in, he jumps in our lap and he licks us and he lets me take him outside. He does his business. And as we're leaving, he comes to the glass door with this sad puppy dog face and uh, he really sold himself. <laughs> so we looked at three other dogs, which we all loved, but we came home and talked about it. My wife said, yeah, that's the one we want. So we got him. And it's like we open the door to a wild badger and let him into our house. <laughs> he has so much energy and he chews, he's got his little puppy teeth that are sharp as razors, like a little piranha. He chews, he loves to chew your hands, he loves to chew at everything. He loves every person he meets. He jumps up on them. He loves our cat who for two weeks stayed upstairs. Now we'll come down, I don't know why, I think he enjoys it. But he gets mauled by the dog and he just, he just likes it. He comes back for more. So the dog hasn't hurt him yet, but it's a little bit scary to see what he does. He's learning not to chew. I've got to the point where I don't have any actual um, red marks on my hands, but uh, he's adorable. But boy, is he a little monster. So we'll see. He's, um, he's like a chocolate lab with a um, uh, shepherd mix but we think he must have some hound dog in him, like some black mouth cur. I don't know if you know those, but they're a hunting dog from down south because he has such a um, prey mentality. He, he loves squirrels. He stares out the window at the squirrels all day long. 
And when we take him outside, he, he just wants to go. We have him on a, a harness so he doesn't get away. But anyway, so um, I have been doing a little bit of turning, but I've been spending a lot of time taking care of this puppy dog. So that's the blue for this one. Like I said, I'm gonna let it dry just like this. It will stick to the paper and I don't care because I'm just gonna sand that off. Um, and it will have some drips, you know, where they, they fall down and you get a little puddle in the middle. And that's all right. That'll just be a spot that is a little more blue and therefore won't sand through. Um, so I'm gonna set that one aside. Make sure I'm not gonna. And I have another one that I thought might be interesting because you never know what you're gonna get until you do it. It's just another effect you can get with the milk paint. I'm only gonna do the outside of this one today. Um, this was a bowl I turned, I don't know, a couple years ago. It was a crotch, and as it dried, it cracked in a couple of spots. I didn't really like that. Um, and so I didn't know what to do with it. And then I thought, well, you know, we'll throw the milk paint on it. And I needed one. I wanted to show you the crackle finish that you can get by using this underglaze called Antique Crackle, sold by the same company, old fashioned. Um, I don't know, it was like $12 or something. It's not a whole lot. It's quite a gel, and you brush it on just like you would the paint. I do have a few drips, but I'm not going to worry too much about those. Um, so, again, I sand this down to 320, put the black on, sand it and buff that down. But because it's going to show through only where the crackles are, I wanted it to be fairly even and consistent. So I went even maybe a little more than I did with, uh, with the vase there. Um, and I think... What would you rather see, the inside or the outside? Let's see the outside. All right, so what I'm gonna try to do is have a pretty good edge around here so that when I do it next week, I can do the inside and we won't see too much of a difference. So it is important that you put this on. If you want the crackle finish, you've gotta let it dry overnight. Um, if you put a finish on an hour, let's say later, when it feels kind of dry, it won't be dry and everything will just mush together and drip and meld and look like, you know, a mess. Having said that, I did that. I threw it on the lathe, I sanded it down, and it had the most amazing final finish. So I will be doing that intentionally on a couple of the ones that we just did today. Um, I don't have one of those to show you, but um, it really, it was the first bowl to sell that year at the craft fair. Um, it had these sort of drips and swirls and, yeah, so sometimes accidents, give you the best results. That probably has a little dust on it just from sitting out overnight. But, uh, so again, this it does matter that you go fairly quickly because it starts to crackle almost immediately and that you do your final brush strokes in the same direction. And hopefully, that's why I had a little bit better brush this time. So I thought I might do a little better job. And you want it to be an even coat. The thicker the coat, the bigger your crackles will be, the, the bigger, in between the crackles. All right, what was the question? They're also from the uh, same, same company. Same company, yep, yep, old fashioned milk paint. Hey. It's a gel, it's a, it's a clear gel. It's an undercoat is what it is. And it, no, it, I painted it on just the gel. Painted that on yesterday, let, actually two days ago, let it dry. I'm gonna try to get a nice. Uh, I did that. No, I have not sanded it after putting the gel on. I sanded it down, did all the finish work with the black, then painted the gel on and let that dry. It's a little bit tacky. It doesn't harden completely. So I don't think you'd want to sand it. I think it would just make a mess. Try to get that edge. Usually I would flip it over and do the, the top right away. But how are we doing time-wise? Are you guys... Oh, it's already slowed down? I was going to say, it seemed like I was making great time. I was moving right along. So, yeah. Yeah. I was trying to shoot for an hour and a half to two hours. I think anything more than that, we're... I still got to sand down the blue one and then do the final finishes. All right, so there's a nice big drip down there. Just, oh, nice. um, if you let it sit too long, 
the top of the milk paint will crust over. And see, I don't want to touch this once it starts to dry or I'll just peel it off. So. Just trying to, oop, like I just peeled it off right there. I have not done a full size salad bowl with the crackle paint. I don't think it would be a good finish for that big a bowl anyway. It's more of an artistic look. I guess I can always sand. I think if I did it again, what I would do is I'd paint the outside with the gel, paint the outside with the blue, then turn it over and do the inside with the gel with the blue. I probably shouldn't have painted the inside with the gel yet, but I'm gonna leave that and see what happens. Yeah, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know if we want to sit and watch or if we want to set it aside and bring it back. Let me do a little cleanup. Uh, go ahead and pass that around so people can see. It comes in a little um, metallic container to keep it fresh. Uh, another note is it doesn't last for days and days. Um, it's pretty much uh, one shot use. Once you mix it up, you want to use it. So only mix up the amount you need. Um, they say you can put it in the refrigerator and it'll last a couple of days, but basically I use it and then just throw it out. So mix up about, mix up a little more than you think you'll need because you hate to run out. Um, and do they sell it pre-mixed? Or is it in the powder form? Powder form, yeah. Um, you can, if you, you can see how there's quite a, a gritty texture to that. And that's okay for what I'm going for. But if you want it to be a smoother texture, you can pour it through a um, paint filter and get rid of a lot of that grit. Or do it a little bit thinner. Um, I, I think I'm gonna set it aside, let it dry, and then we'll look at it in 10 or 15 minutes here. To speak, right? That's, that's off a little too much. That's pulling 24. That's not coming off. I don't really need that for what we're doing here. We do want to. We do want to be able to see inside the bowl as we get a little bit of the copper showing through. All right. It is. Uh, it does. It also um, changes color when you put your final finish on, and every batch is slightly different. Every time you mix it, depending how much water you put in, it's slightly different. Um, scissors. I'm gonna start with a little. All right, so again, in the interest of speeding things along, I sanded the outside of this already, but I just want you to see how it sort of comes alive as you sand it and be able to tell when enough is enough. It's very easy to sand all the way through. So are we, are we on? All right, so I've got it back in my vacuum, Chuck. You can go forward or reverse, it doesn't matter. And again, to speed it up a bit, and I've even gone so much as 220, but I'm gonna go 320 sandpaper. And I usually do wear a mask if I'm doing a lot of this. Uh, it's non-toxic, but you do get a lot of solder stuff into your nose if you're doing this on a big bowl for a long time. You can see the dust in the air there. So I'm gonna go until I just barely start to see some dark coloring. And I'll go both directions. Let's see, the outside, it only took about three or four minutes. But the outside always stands a little easier than the inside, right? 
You don't want to start with, uh, you know, 150 or even a 220. It'll put those circular scratches in there and they, you may never get those out again without sanding all the way through the paint. The only time I've ever had a ball come out of the <laughs> out of the uh, vacuum chuck is when you start to push outward on it. If it's only pulling, you know, 15 or so, then it can come off. But if it's pulling 25, you're not going to get it out of there. And I do have my other hand on there just to stabilize it a little bit. I'm not pushing super hard in the upward direction. Pushing inward, all you're doing is adding to the suction, right? So you can see I'm just starting to sand through in a few spots. And now I'm gonna avoid, I don't wanna sand through too much in some places. So I'm gonna look for where I hadn't sanded through and put a little more pressure in there. So not out at the rim, but in about an inch from the rim, I'm gonna do a little extra. The other nice thing about this sandpaper, you just smack it a few times clean it off and it's good you know unlike the typical sandpapers that, that wear out so much even if you clean them they don't they don't have any cutting ability this one lasts for a while so I'm constantly I'm using a new spot in the sandpaper for that very reason not only am I using a, a, a new spot, but I'm attacking it in a different direction. I have, um, Al Sturt uses that almost exclusively, but he does it with a high speed air gun sander, right, pneumatic sander. And uh, it works great. Um, yeah. Uh, Home Depot selling, I think it's, it's those red discs. Oh, I should have mentioned for larger bowls, I like to use these big flexible discs, which cost quite a bit of money if you buy them from someone who supplies them. What I do is I go to Home Depot and buy a hard disc for $7, put some heavy duty sandpaper on a piece of wood, put it in the drill and just push down while I sand. And that sandpaper sands off as much or as little as you want make it nice and flexible so you can sand and get that flex on the inside of a bowl. So for a bowl this size, I would use these guys. That smaller bowl, I was using the three inch. I'm getting pretty close to enough with that sandpaper. Do a little 400. And you can get as little or as lot as you want. What you don't want to do though is sand all the way through the wood so you get the raw copper. That's 400 right now. I started with 320. And I don't bother going to the um, smaller grit with the yellow sandpaper. I don't think it's worth it. This is also um, cling spore sandpaper. All right, now let's take a look and see. So I am starting to sand through a little bit right there in the rim. I've got a fair amount off there, not as much here. So what I can do if I want to, is I can just come in by hand and just say, hey, I want to sand a little bit more right there. Just go at it for a while. And you can see it starting to show up. That's probably enough there. And maybe I want a little bit. I want to get rid of some of those bubbles there from the sandpaper. So maybe a little bit in there. And that, of course, is the, uh, the ovalness of the bowl. There's always going to be where it's sticking out more. I'm going to sand less. If you did this on a twice turn bowl, you wouldn't have as much of that. So that was 320. So I'll go back to a little 400 to make sure 
all my scratch marks are in circles. And when I do that by hand, I will check and see where I did it. Where did I do it? Right here. Do I have any scratch marks going other than in a nice circle? And I don't think I do. That's where this is very helpful. Does that, well, that does kind of helps. Gives you quite the bright glare though, huh? All right, we won't use it. Uh, I usually don't bother with 600, but for those of you who like sanding, you can do a little 600, right? I don't want any of those circular sand marks. I don't mind. You'll see in all of these, they have some, they have some discolorations in the lathe circle. Uh, and I don't want to sand through it. I think you'll sand through it too quickly. Um, I usually don't use the power sander below 220. And I started with 320 on this. Now I'm switching to the Abernet. Or the, no, not the, the uh, Scotch-Brite pad. And this is where I can take off as much or as little as I want because it'll only take off paint, it won't take off the wood. More polishing it. And if you see a blue spot, you can push a little, you know, a blue stripe, push a little more there. If you see a copper stripe, push a little less. All right, so I have sanded through here a little bit. And so I have tried in the past with some success, to just touch that up with a little black. If I just put a little bit of black on there, sort of smoothing it out a little. Let that dry for a bit. I got oh, so this this is actually some sapwood that's showing up here, and um, I'm not going to ever get that to look like copper. So I'm just going to leave that. That might be what this. No, I think that's where I sanded it through. Um, but there is a little bit of the sapwood on the outside here. So for the large, um, for the smaller bowls, I start with a nice large blank and I sand through all the sapwood, so I don't have any sapwood in it. For the squared around, I'm starting with a dry piece of uh, milled lumber and there's no sapwood in it. Um, and then I can either just do a little bit of this. I'll, I'll come back and hit that before I put a final finish on it probably. Because I think I would like that to be a little bit more of a copper stain right in there. The black reacts with the copper wood. I don't know if it's the tannins in the wood or if it's just a pigmentation, but the two go together to give you that really nice copper look. So I think we're done with this one. Yeah. And you'll see that you get a little bit in the grain pattern and then you get some that's just plain random. You'll almost always get, I could do the rim a little more probably too. Anywhere there's a corner, you're gonna have, it's basically a high spot, so you're gonna get that. Um, anywhere there's the high spots, you're gonna hit that, and anywhere there's a low spot, like right there, or, or any of your nooks and crannies, that's gonna stay blue. Um, same thing in the corner down there is gonna stay blue. Um, I do, on this one, I finish the foot with the same finish. On others, I like to finish that foot off back to the natural cherry, so that when someone picks it up and looks at it, they can see what it would have looked like without the mink milk paint finish, all right? Uh, yep, that's the last thing I'm gonna show you. I, I would like to do it to this one, you know? Because the blue, I'm gonna do it on the, on the one that isn't blue, but the blue really takes on a, a beautiful look. So maybe what we'll do is we'll set that one aside for a moment, just so that, that black can dry for 30 seconds. Uh, you wanna pause the tape for 30 seconds while I wash my hands? All right, so I'm just getting prepared to put a final finish on, on this one here. Uh, I did blow this out with an air compressor to get all the dust out of there and wiped it down. 
And I like to use the um, general finishes salad bowl finish. It's a very clear finish, has a lot of UV protection. It really brings out the color of the wood without um, changing the color very much. Um, I think I told you I did a sample piece of cherry, which is somewhere around, I don't know where it is, but, and uh, did some texturing on it, painted it black and then blue and sanded it down, and then tried several different finishes. I tried the wipe on poly, I tried the spray on finish, and I tried this. Um, and this is what looked the best. So that's just a good tip to you if you're really trying to figure out, hey, what's the best final finish to put on? Make a little test strip and try it in a couple places before you put it on something you put, you know, 10 hours into. Um, again, I like to do the outside first. I just wipe this on with shop towels. Um, it's very important that you keep your lid on tight as this will oxidize and gel very quickly. But if my students, I think the ones who used it were responsible, it's still a very thin liquid, has a ever so slight amber color to it. One tip if you won't want to waste a lot of material, a lot of your finishes, start with a, a small piece to put it on so it's not absorbing, you know, two tablespoons full just in, in there. And I'm going to put it on fairly wet and then I'm going to wipe it off immediately so that it's a thin finish, but it's still wet. It's not tacky. As soon as it gets tacky and you wipe it, you've got a matte finish. I'm looking for a, almost a gloss finish. Um, these shop towels are pretty lint free. These, I think they're by Scott. Uh, I just get them at the hardware store. You used to be able to get them at Home Depot and they stopped carrying this brand. They have another brand that's blue and it is nowhere near as good and it, and it bleeds blue onto your projects, which is just not acceptable in woodworking. Yeah, now I will often do two coats, to be honest with you. And so the first coat I don't care about. But I don't want it to drip. I could just wipe it off with this, but I'm afraid it'll drip. So I take a dry, dry one. And just while it's still wet, I just wipe it once to get off the excess. And I call that good. All right. Don't go back and fuss with it or you'll put marks in. And I'm wearing the gloves because they leave fewer fingerprints, I think. Um, and because I never, I don't know about you guys, but I never have clean fingers when I'm doing this. Even though I wash my hands, they've got something on them. So to do the inside, the, the place I get the drips is right around the outer edge. So I start in the middle, and then I put one finger right there. You had one of those um, Lazy Susan finishing things, you know, that spins around, it might be easier. But I do it all, and then I don't, press down too hard around the edge, although I kind of have to because I have the nooks and crannies, don't I? I normally don't put the nooks and crannies up over the edge like that, but I had a few oops moments with the carving tool. But you do want to get the final finish into those nooks and crannies because it will seal that milk paint, give it a little darker look. I think I better make sure I don't have any drips around the outside. Bottom was finished, yep. And I'm just letting, I don't care. I'm gonna put one finger right there while I wipe it. I don't think I'm gonna wipe this with a dry cloth. And I go down and then I'm done. And that's it, don't mess with it. You'll only make it worse. Um, it's not dust free in here, obviously. I've just been sawdusting. So you will get a little bit of dust. And if you look at that blue one and you feel it, it's not perfectly smooth. So if you have a dust-free environment to do this, great. Often what I'll do is the first coat, I won't care about it. I then sand it with 600, just the tiniest bit. I do it on the lathe so all my circles are perfect circles from the lathe. Just, you know, mm -mm, I'm done, that's it. Just to get off any of the sawdust. And then I do this exact same final finish. You'll see it's gonna get soaked in in some of the um, end grain and so it won't be as glossy as I want. We can see how it really brings out the, the beautiful color of the wood. Overnight. Overnight, yeah. Um, so what you might have wondered why I had these little blocks of wood on them. I have my students, it's so that I can carry it carefully somewhere where it's less dusty, like in the office here and let it dry. So I'm gonna set this in here to dry. And if people don't mind waiting another, 
five or 10 minutes. I would love to do this blue one so you can see the, 